The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, a new power manifests in physics, putting Jupiter and Saturn on a collision course and threatening the stability of the cosmos itself. Apparently, the force don't need money, don't take fame, don't need no credit card to ride this train. It's strong and it's sudden and it's cruel sometimes. I think you know the force we're talking about, but it might just save your life. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. And I'm Bain Intern Allie Heilman. Hello, Allie. So this time we have part one of a two-part interview with Tim Powers talking about his wonderful new contemporary fantasy adventure novel, Alternate Routes, or Alternate Roots, as Tim says. Ghosts roam the Los Angeles freeways, and ex-Secret Service agent Sebastian Vickery has to plug a leak between realities before the L.A. freeways turn into a death trap and a suicide rap. And Tim will talk all about that new novel. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's great high fantasy novel, Son of the Black Sword. But first, here's the news. Whoa, August mass markets are rushing to beaches and vacation spots everywhere and even into the homes of those who never take a vacation. They are ubiquitous. These include great new Leiden Universe novel, The Gathering Edge, by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. A rip in the fabric of space and time causes a battleship fleeing a long-lost war to materialize in an area known as safe space. Now, Clan Corval pilot Theo Waitley must take sides in a war eons in the making. The consequences of her decision might determine the fate of worlds. The fate of worlds. Also out in August is Red Vengeance by Brendan Dubois. 16-year-old U.S. Army Sergeant Randy Knox finds that the government powers that be may not want the devastating war with the alien creepers to be over. Now, as his hodgepodge military unit makes a desperate stand at a remote outpost, Randy will learn just how far he must go to protect those he loves and what it takes to save humanity from alien domination. The Gathering Edge by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller and Red Vengeance by Brendan Dubois are out now at booksellers everywhere. This is part one of a two-part interview with Tim Powers discussing alternate routes. Part two will be available next time on the podcast. Want to welcome Tim Powers to the podcast. Hello, Tim. Hello, glad to be here. Tim Powers won the World Fantasy Award twice for his critically acclaimed novels *Last Call* and *Declare*. *Declare* also received the International Horror Guild Award. His novel *On Stranger Tides* was fun, and Tim also won a couple of them, Philip K. Dick Awards. It was sold to Disney for the movie franchise installment *Pirates of the Caribbean* on *Stranger Tides*. His book, The Anubis Case, won the Philip K. Dick Award, and it's considered a modern science fiction classic and a progenitor of the steampunk genre, which I totally agree with. Tim won the Dick Award again for straight science fiction post-apocalypse novel dinner at Deviant's Palace. Bain recently published Down and Out in Purgatory, the collected stories of Tim Powers, and that book now is a World Fantasy Award finalist. We'll find out later what what happens with that. Not good. That's got some, yeah, coming out, I believe it's next... Did we put it in spring? I think we did. Uh, it's going to be the mass market of that as well, so we have that to look forward to. Out last month was a new edition of Expiration Date, which is part of Tim's Fault Line trilogy, right? Yeah. Yes. And upcoming will be our earthquake weather uh, in the fall. But out now, we have a new Tim Powers hardcover out called Alternate Routes. This is an all-new book. It's cool, creepy, super fun, action-filled, supernatural adventure novel by Tim. Tim Powers grew up in Southern California, still resides there with his wife, Serena. And I guess I I just asked you off uh, off the show, but let me ask you again. uh, The the fires out there at the moment, how are they uh, affecting your life, or are they? They're, They're nowhere near us. 
this year, luckily, though they do seem to be consuming most of the rest of the state. And it is it is unusually hot everywhere. When there were fires very locally here, and at night you could see flames virtually 180 degrees around on the horizon, and we were ready to evacuate with about 30 cat carriers ready to have cats stuffed into them. Uh, in the mornings, you'd find that it had snowed ash, and frequently on the hood of a car, you would find a perfect leaf from a tree made of ash. So you see this gray leaf, but if you touch it, it just turns into gray powder. Very eerie effect, really. You start wondering what things besides leaves might show up made of ash that way. Yeah. Uh, did you just bury the lead? You had 40 cat carriers? <laughs> well, I don't know if it was exactly 40, but it was many. It was at least 10. Uh, and my wife had to label them. Like, these two cats can be put into the same carrier because they get along. This guy has to be by himself because he doesn't get along. And... uh so we were ready to begin stuffing cats into carriers, but luckily it didn't quite come to that. <laughs> I, I gather you're surrounded by cats. Yeah, at the moment I at the moment I only see one, but often there are several on my desk. And there's a dog here panting, lying on the floor. He doesn't like the heat. So uh, we get that. Uh that you live in the L.A. Basin uh, or, or in the, the large area of, yeah. uh, that's surrounded by those mountains that form that basin. And many people find that place a barren concrete valley. <laughs> but for you, it's completely different and alive with, with weirdness and possibility. What kind of sunglasses are you wearing, Tim? Um, why do you think you see it that way? Well, I think anybody with degree of imagination and some acquaintance with L.A.'s history would see beyond the tourist facade to a lot of really weird intrinsic peculiarities in the city. There are valleys north of the city, um, canyons, Benedict Canyon, Laurel Canyon, and among them are odd little mini valleys that seem to be accessible only by way of stairways so that you go up a hill to the crest and then you've found this strange little mini valley. And they'll have weird Eastern religion temples in them and you see monks in weird colored robes and and you think, what? what is that? How did they even get stuff in there to build that place? And often if you go looking for it again, you can't quite find it. And odd streets up in the Hollywood Hills and uh, just about every house you see either has some known peculiar history or just by looking at the place you can tell it has some peculiar history. And, of course, there's sites where unexplained murders happened, sites that are supposed to be haunted. Uh, altogether, it's much more interesting and uh, almost occultly fascinating city. What I mean, obviously, some of this L.A. has crept into other writers' works. Who, who are some of the writers about L.A. that you like? I just wanted to oh, quickly well, ask you some of the Raymond Chandler, of course. I could, in fact, he he is probably the best of the writers who have dealt with L.A., certainly including me. Even though he has no uh, supernatural elements, the L.A. he paints is so colorful and menacing that it wouldn't really surprise you if Philip Marlowe <laughs> ran across a ghost one time. But also, certainly more contemporary, Michael Connolly writes police and courtroom dramas set in Los Angeles, and I find those just riveting. He, he somehow, inexplicably, knows everything about police and lawyers and judges and courtroom procedures and um, 
and at the same time somehow manages to write a book a year. I don't know how he does this. Um, but he also conveys a Los Angeles of his own. It's not mine or Raymond Chandler's, but it's a very distinct and, again, deeply intrinsically menacing and fascinating place. So this is not this is not an alternate L.A. either that we're talking about here. The setting is L.A., right, Tim? Good point. Yeah, it would be inaccurate to describe this as uh, an alternate Los Angeles. No, I, I mean it very emphatically to be this here Los Angeles, the same one you go to when you, uh, you know, you want to go to Cantor's for a roast beef sandwich or go to the Chinese theater to watch a first-run movie. No, it's very definitely meant to be this here same Los Angeles as in the world you live in, yeah. So you've, you've gone to it again in alternate routes. You've gone to an L.A. setting, and, and you've really made it intrinsic to the to the plot of the thing because nowhere are there freeways quite like L.A.'s. Yeah, true. Yeah, I, I remember Joan Didion in one of her essays talked about the sense you get when you're on the freeway of being disconnected from the ordinary city and its streets, which are called surface streets which immediately makes you think, okay, if they're surface streets, freeways must be like deep highways. <laughs> and uh, especially if you're driving at night, you pass off-ramps that you've passed before, but it occurs to you you have no idea what is down that off-ramp. Uh, and if it's sufficiently late at night, you start thinking, I bet it's... I bet it would take you to no normal daytime L.A. location. Uh, so, yeah, freeways kind of almost conjure up their own speculations about time and space dislocations. Yeah. the um, it, I remember I used to have to, when I lived in L.A. for a couple of years and, and was going to film school out there, one night I, I just... Every night it seemed like uh, if I was driving around sufficiently late, I would just come across something odd. I remember one time I drove by a convertible on fire that two uh, people were just staring at, and it was it was like, "Hey, Porsche, the top, the drop top Porsche on fire." And I, what is yeah, the you, story there? Yeah, you constantly wonder what is the story, and part of your mind says it's probably something mundane, and another more convincing part of your mind says, "Nah." You're lucky you did not get involved. I remember seeing one time a big old uh, Land Rover with shovels and gas cans on the back and a guy in a safari hat driving, and it carried its own little dust devil with it, like that character in Peanuts. And it seemed totally obvious that he had just transferred here somehow from about 1940. <laughs> And if I had followed him, God knows where I'd have wound up. But I had to get home. Well, the the sort of er in alternate routes, the the er the the is the Pasadena Freeway. Is that correct? Yes. Why is yeah? That? Well, the Pasadena Freeway is the original L.A. freeway, and they didn't really know how to make freeways yet. Uh, for example, the off ramps are way too tight, too tightly curled for you to get into them at normal freeway speeds. You have to be aware in advance that this is going to be an insanely tight curve and slow down more than you would for more modern freeways. And it has, like all freeways, island patches of ground that are cut off from the rest of the world because they're surrounded by a freeway on-ramp or off-ramp. And all freeways have those, but in the case of the Pasadena Freeway, those are the oldest islands. And sometimes you do see people there with tents, and you think, oh, well, it's just homeless people. You know, it's some homeless guy lost his job. He's living in a tent there. But then that other part of your mind says it's meant to look mundane. The guy is insulated. You can't get there. How did he get there? What is he doing? Well, he's probably just, I don't know, smoking a cigarette, drinking a beer. 
That doesn't, well, can't see him anymore now. We're, we've we've drawn, driven on past. I, I wonder if we loop back, if he would still be there. And those islands especially uh, carry their own implications. I remember about 10 years ago, a truck full of chickens overturned on a freeway, and all the chickens ran out of the truck onto one of these islands, and the city decided, well, they'll starve or get run over. We don't need to bother with them. But a radio disc jockey found out about it and told all his listeners, drive by there and pitch bags of corn out the window onto that island to sustain these chickens. And um, they they were there for several years. For all I know, they're still there. And, and God knows what's on the other islands. They really are. You can see them, but you can't get to them. Like Galapagos Islands, they start evolving their own, uh, yeah. their own species, perhaps over time. So we began, and it's not in an island, but it's in one of those clumps of like uh, what oleander, whatever those bushes are called. Out oh, there, right. Where we where we first meet Sebastian Vickery, our uh, our main character in Alternate Routes. Uh, what what is he up to? Well, he's making use of. Um, the fact that if you have a lot of free wills, which is to say people, uh, moving very fast past a stationary free will, it generates a current, just as electrons moving past stationary electrons generate an electrical current. And it turns out that within this current, which extends for maybe several hundred feet uh, to the side of the freeway, um, there can be induction currents which permit ghosts to appear. And if that sounds like complete nonsense, I swear it's explained more plausibly in the book. And uh, Vickery and other people known as freeway gypsies set up little nests in clearings on the freeway shoulders, which are generally very overgrown, and consult Ghost for pay. If if somebody wants to consult his dead uncle George, he would consult one of these freeway gypsies who would set up the appropriate apparatus to conjure Uncle George out of the current and be able briefly to converse with him. Uh, and in that uh, strip of current on either side of a moving freeway, time <clears throat> as Joan Didion sort of implied, is not quite as neatly uh, sequential as it is out on the ordinary surface streets. And so a little extent of the past or future can also be glimpsed if you know what you're doing there. And certainly if you drive the freeways and look sideways, you do see little clearings among the freeway shoulder greenery, and you think, surely people must go there. And sometimes you even see litter there, and you think, yeah, people perhaps live there. Uh, I wonder what they do. And again, the weird part of your brain says, ah, give me a minute, and I'll tell you what they do. And it involves the supernatural. So who, who all right, so Sebastian is, uh, he has, he has other jobs, but his, he's sort of on the lam, and this is, this is a down-and-out guy now, or at least somebody that, that's hiding. What, who is this guy? How did he uh, oh, well, become a freeway gypsy? <laughs> well, originally he was LAPD policeman, and in his 20s uh, applied for a job with the Secret Service and eventually got it. There's quite a lot of vetting and training that goes into becoming a Secret Service agent. And one day he was accompanying a presidential motorcade in Los Angeles when President Obama was visiting. And President Obama insisted that the motorcade stop at a Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles restaurant, which, in fact, Obama really did do. And the whole motorcade stopped, and it, it's about 40 vehicles. And some are decoy limousines, some are security, some are press. But that, even allowing for them, there's still several vehicles that are not explained. And one of them, I posit, was supernatural monitoring, making use of the crowds on the sidewalk to be stationary free wills while the moving 
motorcade went by, that would generate enough current so that a special sort of Secret Service division could be able to anticipate attacks on the motorcade by several seconds before the events could actually occur. And when that supernatural van was stopped, some guys got out of it, and our hero, poor Vickery, stepped into the van and overheard something on the radio that he should not have overheard, and which made it necessary that this special division of the Secret Service take him out because nobody unauthorized is allowed to know what he heard. And uh, so they attempt to take him away and quietly kill him, but he manages to evade them and therefore has to assume bogus fake identity. And under that fake identity, he stays in Los Angeles since he knows the city very well and gets work both as a freeway gypsy and as a driver of supernatural evasion cars that people hire who want to travel from place to place without being subject to supernatural surveillance. And it's all very under-the-radar employment with, you know, no Social Security withholding or anything like that. And he's really living fairly comfortably in that under-the-radar sort of existence until that dangerous division of the Secret Service catches up with him again, and he finds that he's on the run again, uh, this time accompanied by a woman who was a member of that secret Secret Service, but who has found that she can't stomach the priority of trying again to kill Vickery. Yeah, and she's... As, as her uh, former boss says, uh, she's she was always guided by her conscience. <laughs> Ingrid yeah. Castine, poor woman. Yeah, his, yeah his, her boss said she always has the delusion that she has a conscience. There's a really nice repartee between uh, between Vickery and Castine, and uh, they're they get along. They're part. They become partners in the course of the book, which is just a, a really nice. Um, uh, addition to to the main story. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to have a male and female protagonist pair who are not initially allied at all. In fact, are at least as much at odds with one another as in 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 parallel. Gradually, yes, come to like and trust each other. And I also wanted it not to lead to a romance, which always seems to be the inevitable, you know, uh, unalterable pattern. Oh, now they will fall in love, you know. And I thought, let's not. Let's have them, you know, be friends, allies, etc., but but not romantically involved. I think I got that from the Modesty Blaze books by Peter O'Donnell, in which Modesty Blaze and Willie Garvin are, in effect, partners uh, throughout all the maybe 10 or 13 books, but they're never, they're never in love with one another. Uh, and I always thought that worked real well. For one thing, if you're, uh, if you're going to, as I am doing, write a sequel, what, are they married now? Somehow a married couple isn't as interesting as two free agents bouncing around. Yeah, and the, the friendship that develops is, is cool and fun, and they are both pretty funny as well. They Oh, good. They are make they make a bit of light of their uh, circumstances, so we don't have to go through the book in a in a you know a clenched teeth and scowl. <laughs> yeah, well, they've they've both had some experience. Uh, it's not like they were just PAs or librarians suddenly tumbled into this world. One thing I'm always careful about is I do want to have humor, funny stuff, but I want it to be within the context of the story. I hate in fiction any kind of tongue-in-cheek tone or irony on the part of the narrator, flippancy. I want the characters to find things funny, but I don't want the reader to start thinking I'm making jokes, me the author. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's the and, and it enhances their characters, and we come to like them and, and much more because they're, uh, you know, they're trying to maintain an even keel as any of us might 
<laughs> as we imagine they, are, they might be able to do. Yeah, they are a fun couple. I like them. <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. having fun with them in this sequel, in fact. The agency you call the Transportation Utility Agency, which sounds mundane and scary at the same time. Yeah, that's the cover for the bad secret, secret, secret service. And... Sebastian, whose whose real name was Herbert, and and uh, this all comes very quickly at the beginning of the book, so we're not really giving much away. In addition to being a Secret Service agent and a former cop, he has a the reason he gets involved in all the supernatural stuff. stuff he has a bit of a backstory with um, he, he's able. Not everyone can see the the sort of supernatural entities that that are called up, right? That's um, true. Well, the Transportation Utility Agency, their main Activity is calling up ghosts to question uh, if a Chinese coding clerk dies, they want to summon his ghost to interrogate him. And that's the ostensible purpose of the TUA, is sort of post-mortem espionage. But the boss there, Terracotta, has become obsessed with conjuring up ghosts for another purpose. It does develop that some people can actually see ghosts. The people who can see them are people who are directly responsible for the death of someone who died within the freeway current. And as somebody points out, ending somebody's life for them is about as intimate as you can get with that person. And that fatal intimacy, if it occurred in the freeway current, means that you've got a sort of extra segment of the visible spectrum added to your vision cortex so that uh, you can actually see ghosts. And so if you're in a crowd, you have to assume that at least a few of them are probably not people who are actually physically there. Which is uh, just used incredibly coolly in uh, in various places in alternate routes. I just was reading again today the the graveyard scene where they're oh, where yeah. the ghosts are sitting and they're singing. Uh, what is, oh, what is the song they're singing? Where so have sad. all the flowers gone? <laughs> it's so macabre at the same time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all night long, the ghosts are sitting on their tombstones very quietly singing Where Have All the Flowers Gone, which is a handy one because the lyric comes back around to the beginning again. And so, just like Row, Row, Row Your Boat, you can simply sing it endlessly as they do from sundown to just before dawn. Yeah, that was, I, if I say so myself, a nicely eerie effect. And the So the ghosts, these are Tim Powers ghosts, and so they have a sort of special existence that um, allows there to be souls also, right? Yeah. In that there's, it, we're in a world of weird, weird magic. We're also in, a, in our world where the, the old belief systems are still uh, there and real, like Catholicism in particular in, this, in the case of alternate routes where, where two main characters are, are pricing Catholics. Uh, Vickery even goes to Latin mass. And so... It, Believing in ghosts doesn't necessarily mean that you give up thinking that souls go to heaven or uh, hell or whatever um, right. have existence apart from this. Right. Yeah, I, I derived that originally, I believe, from G.K. Chesterton, who, as I recall, once said, if the ghost of your Uncle George is haunting you, your Uncle George doesn't know anything about it. Uncle George is in heaven or hell or whatever. Um, the ghost is a sort of animate, read-only memory uh, shell that the person cast off in the stress of dying. And so while the person's soul has gone on to whatever awaits souls, the ghost cast off in that moment of trauma wanders around, uh, not very bright, uh, very coherent only for a few moments at a time, which I kind of got from accounts of, of spiritualism, 19th and 20th century. Whenever, they would, whenever a medium would contact a ghost, the messages they got are all just moronic. You think, what, 
what happened? I remember seeing a book of poetry by Percy Shelley that had been dictated to a medium. And you read it and you realize Shelley had just lost all his skill. So, so I always picture ghosts as being these kind of uh, revenant apparitions who think they're the person they're a ghost of, but in fact are these semi imbecilic cast off snake skins, which yeah. living people can a, find uh, useful. I saw a cicada uh, uh, yeah. skin yesterday, and it kind of reminded me of the, one of your ghosts in a way. Yeah, if you picture that cicada skin getting up and starting to crawl around and imagining that it is the original cicada, <laughs> that would be it. And, of course, living people find it useful to conjure these poor creatures um, because they have no discretion. The ghosts don't. A secret the living person kept all his life, the ghost might just uh, unthinkingly babble out because the ghost really will have virtually all of the living person's memories cast off in that sort of, as I say, ROM form, read-only memory. This was part one of a two-part interview with Tim Powers discussing alternate routes. Part two will be available next time on the podcast. Now we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa, book one in the saga of the Forgotten Warrior. After the War of the Gods, the demons were cast out and fell to the world. Mankind was nearly eradicated by the seemingly unstoppable beasts. Until the gods sent the great hero Ram Rowan to save them, he united the tribes, gave them magic, and drove the demons into the sea. But as centuries passed, the descendants of the great hero grew in number and power. They became tyrannical and cruel, and their religion nothing but an excuse for greed. The people rose up, and the surviving royalty and their priests were made castless, condemned to live as untouchables. The age of law had begun. Ashok Vidal has been chosen by a powerful ancient weapon to be its bearer. He is a protector, a member of an ancient military order of roving law enforcers. No one is more merciless in rooting out those who secretly practice the old ways as Ashok. But Ashok isn't who he thinks he is. And when he finds himself on the wrong side of the law, the consequences lead to rebellion, war, and perhaps transformation. Now here is the latest entry in Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. Without hesitation, Ashok leapt over the side after it. His boots hit solid wood. He could still feel the vibrations of the fleeing demon. This level was darker, damper, covered in hanging ropes and moist nets and the stink of fish. Only the castless ate the unclean animals of the ocean. Catwalks stretched between the stilts and scaffolds. There were beds of flea-ridden straw in every corner. This place was nastier than the foul huts above. Even among the castless, there was rank. So how low did one have to sink to be the lowest amongst them? There was a crash and a shout just ahead. Ashok ran down the catwalk, threw a rain of smoke and ash from above and a mist of salt water from below. A shack had been constructed of discarded garbage, using the stilts of a real building as a frame. There was a hole in the wall where the demon had smashed through. Inside the shack were several women and children, filthy, ragged, and thin. The untouchables had been hiding hoping the demon would pass them by, but instead they had wound up right in its path. A male castless, old, defiant, and tiny, was the only thing between the monster and its victims. Ashok had never known that one of the non-people could be capable of real bravery, but this castless dreg was defending the shack like he was a warrior defending the capital. Only Ashok noted that the old castless was holding the demon back, with a spear. That was a severe violation of the law. 
The demon swatted the spear aside and the old man with it. It would crush the cowering humans just out of spite before leaping to the surf below. Only Ashok reached it first and drove Angruvadal through its back and out its stomach. You shouldn't have come here, demon, he said, as he wrenched his sword free, spilling the demon's dinner of partially digested villagers. It twisted around and swung at him, but he ducked, and the blow shattered several of the stilts instead. He stabbed upward through its armpit, deep into the meat of its chest cavity. At this rate, the hut was going to collapse on top of them, and it was not his place to needlessly kill the property of House Gujara. Get out of here, Ashok ordered the castless as he pushed the demon back against the other supports. But rather than flee, the non-people were jabbering and squealing at him in their rough, mangled dialect. There's two of them, behind you. A child pointed back the way he'd come. The sword warned him as well, a sudden rush of instincts and a desire for self-preservation, and Ashok threw himself aside. Even then, a black blur of demon flesh rubbed against him. The interlocked plates protected his chest, but where the hot hide brushed against his face, blood came welling up through his lacerated skin. Two demons. Both of the huge creatures were on him then, clawing and snapping, they were identical in size, shape, and viciousness. He'd never faced such a challenge before, but the sword had, and it told him exactly what to do. Ashok slashed and danced between the limbs, painting with blood and bone-shard sparks. He hit them each with a dozen clean strikes, each sufficient to kill a man, but it barely slowed the demon's onslaught. A claw broke mail and sliced into his left arm. Another claw cut a gash through his cheek. The fresh pain merely kept Ashok focused. He was unable to feel fear, only a cold calculation of the odds, and it wasn't looking good. At least the first demon was no longer trying to escape. The demons were bigger and stronger. But Ashok was moving constantly, trying to keep one of the savage creatures in front of the other, so he only had to respond to one set of attacks at a time. There was no room to maneuver here. The castlers were running or clambering down the hanging nets like monkeys. There was a loud thump overhead as a burning beam landed on their improvised roof. Instinct whispered to Ashok, and he swung upwards, smashing through the thin boards and spilling flames onto the demons' heads. They had no visible eyes, but the burning roof support seemed to blind them. Ashok stabbed, taking one through its pelvis. Then he lowered his shoulder plate and crashed into the other, driving it off balance. The demon flesh scraped the paint from the ornate carvings of his armor, then grated across his now exposed arm. For a beast of the depths, the demon felt remarkably dry and hot. His ploy worked and the creature was put off balance and sent crashing through the ramshackle wall over the edge, where it struck the hanging nets, thrashing about and entangling itself. Seeing where it was suspended, Ashok leapt across, caught hold of the netting above the demon, and hung there, swinging in the fiery wind, dangling from the rough hemp with one hand. There was still a demon on the platform behind him, and the one thrashing below him, but that was only for a split second, because then Ashok struck at the ropes, cut them all in one swing, and dropped the entangled demon to the shore below. It hit the rocks with a thud. Ashok glanced down and saw that fallen demon was twitching, its thick skull cracked open and leaking white. Hopefully, that one was finished. He scrambled up the ropes and rolled onto the top platform. The fire had spread quickly. There was a thump as the other demon leapt up and landed next to him. He attacked, but the demon intercepted his arm with a blow that would have killed an ox. Bones cracked and Ashok's sacred sword went bouncing across the floor. Damned blood loss. He must have been injured worse than he thought. He'd never lost hold of his sword before. He called upon the heart of the mountain to seal his wounds as he lurched to his feet, 
but the demon struck him hard enough to deform steel plates and knock him through the wall of a shed. The protector landed in a cloud of splinters. The shed was burning around him. Flames were licking up the walls as Ashok crawled in the direction of his sword. There was still air to breathe near the floor, but his chest was so racked with pain that it hardly mattered. The second demon followed him. Webbed toes gliding soundlessly across the wood, its lump of a head clanking through the dangling chains and hooks, sending them swinging. The demon would reach him before he would reach his sword. It bent down, and claws slid through his armor, clothing, and skin, hoisting him from the ground, up into the smoke and toward black teeth. Blood poured from the lacerations on his back, but he ignored the pain and fought, striking with his elbow against the beast's thick skull. All he did was lose more skin. It lifted Ashok up, then smashed him back down through a support beam and hard onto the floor. And Gruvadal was just out of reach. Ashok lay there, the air driven from his body, flat on his back, glaring at his impending death. The old castless appeared through the smoke, bellowing incoherently, and jabbed his illegal spear into the demon's back. Even the finest steel had a difficult time piercing demon hide, so the blade bounced off harmlessly. The demon swiveled its eyeless lump of a head toward the castless, not realizing in time that this non-person was no threat, only a momentary distraction but it was enough for Ashok to roll over and lunge for his sword. His fingers closed around Angruvadal's grip as the demon turned back to finish him. The angle was awkward, but Ashok had desperate strength and the sharpest sword ever forged. Black hide parted, hardened bone shattered, and the demon toppled as its leg came off in a spray of shimmering white. The protector struggled back to his feet. Now it was the demon's turn to crawl. One arm was hanging useless at his side, but Ashok could fight with either, and he went about methodically hacking the demon to pieces. The demon rolled over and raised one of its claws, almost as if it were begging for mercy. The line opened in its lump of a head, and alien sounds poured out, a series of incomprehensible hisses and gurgles. Ashok paused for a moment. He'd never known demons had language. There was no way to know what it was trying to say, but it didn't matter. The law was very clear on this matter. You are guilty of trespass. Then Ashok swung and hacked a massive chunk of flesh from the top of its head. There was a crack as more supports gave way. The floor shifted hard to the side. He could stand unbelievable pain and recover from injuries which would instantly kill a normal man, but that didn't mean he could breathe smoke or survive being in a collapsing stilt house as it was consumed by fire. It was time to take this fight elsewhere. Ashok put his boot on the dying demon and shoved it over the edge of the platform. Chapter 2 Protector of the Law, Twenty Years Senior, Ashok Vidal stood on the damp rocks watching the burning village slide into the sea. The two demons were lying in the sand where they'd finally died. They were unclean so he would leave them for House Gujara's wizards and alchemists to pick over. Every part of a demon's body was incredibly valuable for the magic stored within. The profit to be found in those two bodies was worth far more than the loss of a single poor village. His body ached. A few bones had cracked, but the bleeding from his many wounds had slowed to a trickle. Ashok would need to rest for a few hours in order to let the heart of the mountain do its work. The heart was the source of the Order's power and their greatest secret. The covenant was simple. It kept them alive and made them strong. In exchange, they protected the law. 
Within a day, he'd be ready to fight again. When the heart was done with him, he would die. But until then, he would serve. Someone was stumbling along the beach in the first light of the dawn. At first, Ashok thought it might have been one of the Gujaran warriors, since he was carrying a spear. But it was the old castless instead. The untouchable was a tenacious one, but he'd been born into the wrong caste. The monsters are dead, but how are you still alive? The castless asked him. Ashok did not immediately respond, first because the castless's dialect was thick, uneducated, and difficult to understand. And secondly, because he wasn't used to being spoken to so directly by someone of such low station. The further one got from proper civilization, the more the legal divisions between the castes became blurry. But still, he was of the elite, the first caste of governors, and this wasn't even a real person. Living by all this salt water must have driven the old castless mad. I was stronger than they were. You are bleeding. The castless was right, but his wounds would heal, as they always did. It was very hard to end a protector's life. It was kill them quick, or not at all. And your face. The old castless made a scraping noise. No one would ever accuse Ashok of being pretty, even without any new scars. But this old fool was giving him more important things to be concerned about. Your overseers are failing. It's against the law for a non-person to possess a weapon. It was as if the castless had somehow not expected the challenge, but they weren't very bright. He held the shaft close to his chest protectively and shouted, It's mine! No, it is not. Ashok scowled. The law demanded that he go over there and cut the castless down for this violation, but Ashok was wounded and very tired. He quoted the statute from memory. A non-person may only possess the tools granted to it necessary to fulfill its assigned duties. Castless are never allowed to take up arms. I didn't steal it. I found it washed up on the beach. Good. If he'd stolen it from a warrior, then regardless of how exhausted Ashok was, he'd have to execute him on the spot. A member of the first caste didn't thank a castless for anything. But this creature had saved his life, so Ashok had no desire to harm him. Then you may live. The area was being secured by the Paltan. Several warriors had spotted him, and a shout went up that the protector was still alive. Then they saw the first dead demon and began to cheer. That noise turned into a stunned silence when they saw the second demon. No one had expected that. Word spread quickly, and more warriors came running. Soon he had a crowd on the beach, all staring at him and the two huge, lifeless bodies. Even in the stillness of death, they were still sleek and intimidating. Some of them ran off to alert their wizards so that the bodies could be butchered before the magic spoiled. But the rest of the warriors of House Gujara went on cheering Ashok. He didn't particularly care, but they had never heard of anyone defeating two demons, so he allowed it. Some were bowing their thanks. The fat Havildar he'd smacked some sense into had put his forehead clear into the sand, probably hoping that a sufficient sign of deference now might save him from a flogging for his earlier cowardice. Ashok was too tired and injured to care about the honor. The dents in the armor over his ribs was annoying and needed to be hammered out so he could breathe freely again. He began untying the many straps when he realized that he'd almost forgotten his earlier distraction. The fool with the spear was still there. Turning to the old castless, he waved his hand dismissively. This transgression will be overlooked due to your circumstances. Throw down that spear and return to your overseer. It was a remarkably merciful act for a protector. No! 
the old castler shouted. He slammed the butt into the rocks for emphasis. It is mine! Ashok was stunned by the outburst. The assembled warriors looked up in surprise. It is forbidden. He should have acted decisively already. To do otherwise was to make the law appear weak before these witnesses. And the law held no leeway for the lowest showing any disrespect to their superiors. I'm the one who took it out of the water. I'm the one who cleaned off the rust and sharpened the edge on a rock. I used this to protect my family. Castless didn't have family. They were all property, to be organized according to the overseer's will. Was this imbecile trying to provoke him? Fighting isn't your duty. Ashok nodded toward the warrior caste. It's theirs. Where were they when the demon came? No duty for them. No. The warriors supposed to guard this village, they ran. They ran away and left us to die. That is true. Ashok agreed. The assembled warriors began to mutter to each other at this terrible insult against their caste, but Ashok cared about their opinions about as much as he cared about the castlesses. Only truth doesn't change the law. Who will protect us from the warriors? The fish eater speaks of revolt, exclaimed one of the soldiers, as another knocked an arrow. This had gone too far. Insolence could not be tolerated. Why am I wasting my time? It was like reasoning with a pig. He should have just taken the castless's head and been done with it. But Ashok lowered his voice and tried one last time. The warriors wouldn't be able to hear him over the crashing surf. What he was about to admit would bring shame to the order. You helped me. You probably saved my life so I do not wish to kill you. Then don't. I have to obey the law like everyone else. The law is wrong. The old castless snarled as he lowered the spear and aimed the point at Ashok's face. The law is everything, Ashok whispered. And then one of the warriors casually shot the disobedient castless through the chest with an arrow. He was so thin that the arrow sped clean through his torso and skipped down the beach. The castless's eyes widened in surprise. He managed to turn and take a few halting steps before falling on his face, where he twitched a few times and then lay still. His precious spear rolled free and clattered down the rocks. At least the man didn't suffer. That was curious. Ashok had never thought of a castless as a man before. The protector lifted his hand in front of his face. Rivulets of blood had dried between his fingers, and for just a second, it was as if he was looking at the small hand of a child. Then the moment was gone. The water on his hands was unclean salt water, and the blood was only his own. This was not a dream. This was real. The warrior who had released the arrow had already gone back to marveling at the mighty demons. No one remarked on what had just transpired. There was nothing noteworthy about putting down a disobedient dog. More warriors joined him as he stood over the corpse, including the Rizalda, the experienced leader of fifty who had escorted him on the long hunt. Excellent work, Protector. I will convey word of your great victory to Arthakur. Your unmatched skills have brought incredible honor to your order. House Gujara will remember this deed forever. You have saved us from this menace. It was only a castless. Ashok muttered. I meant the pair of sea demons. Oh. The sand beneath the untouchable's body was slowly turning red. Of course. Are you all right, Lord Protector? Do you need to rest? You appear to be hurt. We must clean your injuries. Wounds fester quickly in this jungle. Distracted, Ashok shook his head. I can't get sick. In Vidal, they used cremation. Ashok had no idea what the traditions of House Gujara were. How do you dispose of your dead? For the villagers, 
the worker caste will tend to their own, the Rizalda said, before realizing that Ashok was still looking at the body. For this, it's a castless. I don't know what they do for non-people. Let the gulls and the crabs eat him. Please come along, sir. You look like you need to sit down. What would you do for one of your own men? The Rizalda seemed confused by this. Gujarin warriors bury our own dead. The labor is performed by those whom he has served with. That made a sort of sense. Ashok glanced around. The ground at the edge of the jungle didn't seem too rocky. We will require a shovel. What? The Rizalda was incredulous. He looked at the blood drying on Ashok's scalp as if searching for signs of a head injury. Why would you have us bury this wretch? Because he showed more heart than any of your cast did tonight. It hadn't been meant as an insult, but the Rizalda certainly took it that way. His face darkened with rage. But no matter how skilled he was, or how injured Ashok might be, he wasn't fool enough to risk a duel with a man carrying an ancestor blade. Has offense been given? Ashok asked quietly. No, Lord Protector. Offense has not been taken. The Rizalda replied in a legally acceptable manner for avoiding a duel. The warriors were too distracted to notice that the discarded spear was being carried back out to sea by the tide. Ashok sighed. Forgive me, Rizalda. I'm weary and have misspoken. You and your men may attend to your master's village. I release you from your obligations to my order. Your responsibility to escort me has been fulfilled. I will make my own way from here. The officer gave him a stiff bow and then stormed off. Ashok needed to rest for a bit. And then he would find a shovel. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, to Great Bane intern Allie Heilman, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And shape-shifting skinwalkers, a druidic talisman, and the last remaining stardust from the second star on the right. Thanks, praise, and plaudits for Tim Powers, author of Alternate Roots. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. 